Thank you so much for that kind introduction. My name is Jennifer Empey, and today I will be discussing UV visible derivative spectroscopy, going into its theory and applications. So first, before we get into derivative measurements, we should discuss UV visible spectroscopy in general. Uh, so this method is used to probe electronic transitions within a given material. So first, we will shine our light of intensity I0 onto our sample. And given that the photon uh, wavelength used allows for sufficient energy to promote electrons from our ground state to our excited state, we should see a um, absorption of that light and effectively a loss of the intensity of that given light. Now, within the software, we use this following equation, which essentially uses the ratio of that I0 and I intensity to determine an absorption of our sample, which is calculated as a function of wavelength. So here we can see the absorption spectrum just as an, an example. It's fairly broad, which is typical for UV visible absorption spectra, and that will come in play a little bit later in this presentation. Now this absorption uh, value that's calculated as a function of wavelength, uh, it can be shown to be uh, linearly proportional to the concentration of a given analyte through Beer's law as shown here. So what can be done is a standard curve can be created using varying concentrations of a given analyte um, and recording the spectra of those different samples. Uh, and from here, we can extrapolate for a given unknown what the concentration of the given analyte is in that sample. So UV visible spectroscopy is a, is a technique typically used for this quantification purpose. Now, considering that samples are not ideal, uh, we have to consider a complex matrix and what can happen in those environments. So complex matrices can often contain multiple chromophores or multiple analytes that have an absorption spectrum. And given that these absorption spectra are fairly broad, it can be very easy for them to overlap with one another. Now, from Beer's law, we can see that um, absorption is uh, proportional to concentration, so we would like to be able to use that value to determine the um, concentration of these various components. However, the measured absorption is an additive property by which multiple chromophores at a given, wave given, given wavelength, uh, the absorption from each of those chromophores will add up to the measured absorption. So we'll see that the uh, analytes can overlap with one another, causing some uh, difficulties in determining the concentration of that specific analyte or determine just the uh, lambda max if this is a sample with uh, various unknowns. Now for samples where there is more information known about the various chromophores including concentrations of specific chromophores in solution, this, prob this problem can be uh, avoided. However, for a majority of samples, it may be unknown exact concentrations of these components uh, at a given time allowing for the spectral interference to affect those qualitative and quantitative results. So as an example, uh, here we're going to show the analysis of a cod liver oil sample. Uh, cod liver oil is a common supplement and is known to contain multiple absorption co uh, components. Uh, specifically, we're going to uh, attempt to isolate the uh, amount of vitamin A in our cod liver oil, though it does also contain a variety of other components like vitamin D that could be potentially causing uh, issues uh, measuring this absorption spectrum. Now, quantification for a variety of different products can be important for QAQC purposes. Uh, so being able to determine how much of a given sample is present in the final product can be important to analyze. And there are a variety of methods that can be used. HPLC is one of them, which is a, a useful tool when you have these more complex mixtures. However, it can be fairly time consuming. It's an expensive instrument um, at times and the sample recovery can be fairly difficult post analysis. So for samples where you may want to either further analyze the same sample downstream or use it for some other product downstream, uh, this method can be a little tricky under those circumstances. So this is why we would like to be able to use UV visible absorption analysis, a method which is quicker, it's uh, less expensive comparatively to HVLC, and it's non-destructive, so it's easy to retain that sample post-analysis. Now the caveat being that that spectral overlap problem does make analysis of complex mixtures very difficult. So here, using our cod liver oil as an example, we would like to be able to see how we can use UV visible derivative spectroscopy to better analyze these complex samples. <laughs> 
So first, we should start with just the general definition of what that first derivative would be in the context of absorption. So here, that first derivative would relate to the rate of change of that absorption as a function of wavelength. So we're essentially looking at the slope of this absorption curve as we move across the spectrum. Um, now, this will also inherently require that the derivative of the molar extinction coefficient be present, as this value is also a wavelength-dependent value. However, the concentration will not change by taking the first derivative of the spectrum, as can be shown in this um, math equation here. So this uh, technique could potentially help us with analysis further downstream. Now the absorption spectrum uh, derivative, its first derivative, will have this type of uh, feature. So where we have this peak, we should see a maxima and minima. And where that uh, maximum and minimum reach an inflection point, we will see um, the location of our lambda max. So that's how we can qualitatively assess a data set using our derivative spectroscopy. Uh, this method helps avoid some of the baseline shift or tilt issues which may be present and allows us to resolve some finer spectral details. So some spectra may have shoulders which are representative of uh, slightly different electronic transitions within the material. We can better ascertain what those shoulders uh, relate to through this kind of method. Now thankfully modern spectrophotometers are able to calculate the derivative from the measured absorption spectrum instead of relying on some wavelength modulation techniques which was used in the past. So this analysis can be done fairly quickly and allows us to not only collect the first derivative spectrum but we retain that absorption spectrum for analysis later if need be. So we have multiple data sets that we can pull information from through this analysis. Now, moving back to our discussion of complex matrices, for a derivative spectrum, we should expect, with the first derivative specifically, to see multiple inflection points that correspond to the lambda max for respective chromophores. As you can see in this example here, we do see a lambda max at 300 and a lambda max at 350, uh, respectively, for the uh, inflection points of that sample. Now, this analysis allows us to avoid some extra sample prep that may be required, such as separations that allow for uh, <clears throat> analysis of these uh, components within the solution. And this is uh, applied in a variety of different spaces, such as food and bev, and our pharmaceuticals or biopharmaceutical industries. Now, I'll have you direct your attention just to this uh, graphic here at the bottom. You'll see that the um, Inflection point for this uh, weaker feature is a little bit more difficult to see. So inflection points for weakly absorbing chromophores or chromophores which are fairly close to one another can be a little difficult to resolve um, and to prove that we do need to have a technique to allow for better resolution just to determine qualitatively where that peak cannot lie. So what we can turn to uh, potentially are these higher order derivatives. Now this is not used uh, as often as the first derivative would be used, but it is cited in liter literature as methods um, for analysis for a variety of different systems. So for these higher order derivatives, uh, we can see that there is slightly different um, analyses available for qualitative determination of that lambda max. So for odd derivatives, first, third, fifth, we should expect to see a inflection point at the location of the lambda max whereas even derivatives will show a minimum or a maximum at that uh, in uh, lambda max location. So here we can see that the second derivative spectrum helps us a little bit better visualize where that uh, second component um, absorbs, though keep in mind this is um, not going to be exact just because we are working with these overlapping features that are going to influence that spectrum in some way. So this helps us get a generally better idea of where that location can be. So we're able to kind of get a little bit better resolution of that band position. However, as we are applying these higher order derivative functions, that will inherently introduce more noise into these uh, calculated spectra. So oftentimes these have to be coupled with some type of smoothing procedure, such as a savitsky golay function, to allow for better analysis. And something else to point out is that with increasing um, order of our derivative, we will see an increase in the complexity of the spectrum that we're analyzing. So that increased complexity 
is pretty difficult if you're working with systems in which you are not familiar with what components are present. Uh, those higher order derivatives are typically only used if you are familiar and aware of what components are present in your sample. So let's go ahead and turn back to our cod liver oil sample. So here in this graph here, I have the absorption spectrum, calc uh, sorry, the absorption spectrum measured for our all trans retinol standard, which is a standard used to analyze the vitamin A um, content of our material and a spectrum of our cod liver oil. And as you can see, there is a similar feature observed for both all trans retinol and cod liver oil centered close to about 330, 325 nanometers. However, there is a secondary feature that can be observed in our cod liver oil sample at wavelengths shorter than 300, uh, which presumably is related to either vitamin D or another chromophore that's in solution. So first, we took our first and second derivative spectra of our uh, all trans retinal standard. And we can see that there are two strong um, inflection points and two strong, uh, sorry, two noticeable inflection points and two strong uh, minima from our second derivative inflection points uh, were found in the first derivative spectrum for our all trans retinal. Uh, and these spectra, both the first and second derivative are pretty consistent with literature. So we are able to effectively uh, at least replicate what we see in literature for the standard. So then turning to our sample of interest, we see that there are similar peaks in um, troughs in the locations for a, uh, our all trans retinol that are also observed in cod liver oil with slight shifting just because again, it is a complex matrix. We do expect to see some slight shifting in the first and second derivative spectrum. Uh, and an additional strong uh, feature present at shorter wavelengths uh, where the secondary component is present. Uh, so we're able to use this method to a little more effectively uh, ascertain that there is likely all trans retinol present in this sample. Now, while qualitatively we feel pretty comfortable saying that there is vitamin A in the sample, quantitatively we would like to get a better idea of how much so here we can kind of go into those different derivative spectroscopy methods that can be used for quantitative analysis. Uh, this first method is the, referred to as the tangent method. This uses the first derivative spectra as an analysis um, system. And essentially a tangent line is drawn between the two maxima surrounding a given minima for our analyte of interest. And we effectively draw a line that uh, connects the minimum of our graph to the location of the tangent line um, at that specific wavelength. Uh, and the magnitude of that line A, as is shown in this graph, can be plotted as a function of the concentration of the analyte to develop a standard curve that we can use as our um, system for analysis of an unknown thing. Uh, this is particularly helpful when there is minimum background present in your sample. Now, a secondary method that can be used is this peak-to-peak -peak method. Uh, this method uses the first derivative, again, of our spectrum. Uh, and instead of using the tangent method where we arbitrarily choose a different type of line, instead, this uses the relative magnitudes of our maxima and minima peaks. Uh, we take the sum of those magnitudes, and that is now used as a function of analyte to develop our standard curve. Uh, this method is also particularly good when there is a complex matrix uh, present. And our final method is not so much a quantitative analysis, but more so a mathematical check to determine whether we have background interference. Uh, this is the ratio method, which uses the first derivative, again, of our spectrum and plots the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and it uh, takes the ratio of the magnitude of our maxima and minima peaks for a sample and for a standard and compares those to one another. If those ratios are different, then it is expected that there is some type of background interference affecting the sample itself. Now, I will note that while this is a very useful quantitative analysis, techni analysis technique, if you do have spectra with maxima that are too close to one another, or chromophores in general that have very significant overlap, this derivative result will be difficult to interpret, and it's unlikely that you'll see some very 
defined differences. So while this is very useful, it is specific to systems where you can at least have a better sense of that separation. Now for our sample, um, we did use the tangent method specifically. So here I have a graph that demonstrates what those uh, tangent lines look like for a variety of different retinal concentrations as our uh, standard curve. And then developing the standard curve, we were able to plot that A value that I described previously as a function of our retinal concentration and received uh, results for our cod liver oil that were consistent uh, with the expected results based on the label that we received for the sample. So we were able to use this derivative spectroscopy technique to uh, fairly accurately determine how much retinol was present in solution without requiring any type of separation uh, and allowing us to keep that sample intact. So through these experiments, we're able to demonstrate that UV visible derivative spectroscopy can be applied to these complex systems and can be particularly helpful when uh, analyzing analytes which have overlapping uh, spectra. Now this analysis is useful for a variety of reasons, mainly that we don't require any of these sample prep or separation steps. We can do this measurement fairly quickly and the software can do the calculations of those derivatives fairly fast as well. Uh, and this technique overall is non-destructive. So we can take the sample and use it for further downstream processing or use it for an additional type of analysis technique or some secondary check if needed. Qualitatively, it's useful to be able to determine where that lambda maximum location is for a quick identification purpose or to even to be able to determine at least generally uh, how many different chromophores are potentially in solution. Now, quantitatively, uh, we are able to effectively use that first derivative spectra to analyze the analyte concentration, given that we still have these overlapping peaks, so we don't have to worry about that separation step to get that quantification. Um, we can do it a little bit more quickly this way. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you so much for listening.